Hi, this is Bob Greenberger, author of Star Trek, The Complete Unauthorized History, and many, many other books. And for the years, I've been talking about comic books and science fiction. I've been working in the field, and I'm now reduced to appearing on Mr. Media. I hope you enjoy it. Today on Mr. Media, I'll talk to Andy Mangles co-author of the autobiography Lou Scheimer creating the filmation generation it's the story of the man behind such Saturday morning cartoon and live-action favorites as Superman Star Trek the Archies and Shazam stick around and if I revert back to nine-year-old me and you don't well just means I'm having more fun than you are Today's episode of Mr. Media Interviews is brought to you by GoDaddy.com. You know GoDaddy.com from their wild and sexy commercials, but isn't it time you actually test drove their web hosting and domain registration services yourself? For a limited time, Mr. Media listeners can save 10% on the already low price of web hosting services at GoDaddy.com by entering the promo code POD4 at checkout. Again, that's 10% off web hosting when you go to GoDaddy.com and enter the promo code POD4, that's P-O-D, the number 4, at checkout. Mr. Media is recorded live before a studio audience of superheroes, space travelers, Cosby kids, and teenage rock stars in the new new media capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida. I'm nine years old, and the most exciting day of the week is Saturday, because that's when the cartoons are on. Now, who could forget the excitement of getting out of bed early and planting him or herself in front of the TV to watch the Archies, Fat Albert and the Cosby Kids, hey, 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 Star Trek, Groovy Ghoulies, and all the rest. It was only today as an adult that I discovered so many of my favorite Saturday morning epics from the late 1960s and early 70s were a product of Filmation Studios and its head, Lou Scheimer. Heck, Filmation even put Shazam! Shazam! The live-action adventures of Billy Batson and Captain Marvel on the air. What I wouldn't give to have that on DVD today, although, to be honest, I'm sure it wouldn't live up to my memory of it. I suspect it, you know, what I remember it as 11, 10, 10 years old, it's probably a lot better, it's probably a lot better then than if I watched it now. Now, Andy Mangles, my guest today, has helped write the autobiography, Lou Scheimer, Creating the Filmation Generation. Now, getting my hands on a copy of the book, which is jam-packed with photos, many black and white, which ironically is the way that I originally enjoyed watching the Filmation shows as a kid, was a thrill and a half. Now, if you remember these shows as fondly as I do, and want to hear some great stories behind them, I encourage you to order a copy of this book. And Andy Mangles, welcome to Mr. Media. Hi. Well, thanks. Thanks, Bob. Uh, I appreciate being here, and I cannot express in mere words how cool I found this book to be. Um, it's just, you know, you see all these uh, shows and characters all in one place, and there's background stories. How did you get involved with Lou? Well, I had written a book called Animation on DVD, The Ultimate Guide, which was kind of a phone book size book. Uh, that was a guide to every animated DVD that had appeared by about 2004 on the market. And it talked about what the special features were, uh, what the content of the DVDs were, but it also talked about what the historical aspects of each project was. And as a pop culture historian and writer for the last uh, 25, 30 years, it was important to me to not only showcase what the product was but also the history of it and after that book came out i was approached by multiple dvd companies and and uh you know a lot of them really used the book as a a good reference one of them bca eclipse brought me in 
uh, they gave me a call and brought me in to consult with them because they had just gotten the rights to do He-Man and the Masters of the Universe as a DVD set. And they wanted they wanted to do something that was not just uh, putting the, the set out there for the fans and, and doing nothing with it. They knew that this had a, a really rich history of fandom. And, and so they wanted to do something special with it. So they brought me in to consult on that project. And I flew down to Los Angeles for a meeting with them and left the meeting with the job of, of doing all the special features on the series of He-Man DVDs mm. and uh, did documentaries, commentary tracks, things like that. In the process of that, I got to meet Lou Scheimer, who was the head of Filmation Studios and one of the three founding members in the 1960s and was the only founding member that was actually still with the company when it closed in the in the late 1980s. And Lou was the type of guy who he would start a story and three hours later he would he would finally wrap up that story, but meantime he had taken eighty or ninety, you know, off roads into other stories, and the entire time you would just be riveted mm. to what he had to say because he was he's a master storyteller. And not only was he a good storyteller, but he had lived through so much of the history of television animation and he had been a part of so much of it and I, I i did a couple of interviews with him for the dvd sets and then bc i got the rights to do the rest of the filmation library so i did even more interviews with him and it, it became i i kept thinking every time i would talk with him why is it that as much as i know about animation and the history of animation why is it that i don't know these stories mm -hmm. Why is it these stories have never been told before? And what I discovered was that although there's been lots of books about Warner Brothers and Hanna-Barbera and Walt Disney and about the importance of those studios to animation history, there had only ever been one book about filmation. It was a small press book and had a very limited press. Run. And really the entirety of this company that had radically altered the face of television animation had not been told and so that's when i said you know what let's uh let's do this book let's give lou's story a voice and really talk about what the history of television animation was and what part filmation had in it by the way uh, congratulations on getting in the the fastest plug for an unrelated product uh, in the history of this show. I think you got it in the second sentence of the interview, so good job. <laughs> you want to give us the title of that other book again? It's Animation on DVD, The Ultimate Guide. <laughs> okay, all right, fair enough. I, well, I, and I'm, I, I'm kidding, but uh, you know, someone who's interested in what we're talking about with Filmation will probably be interested in that. I gather you must be a bit of a, a, a animation fan to be this uh, this in, involved in it. Yeah, you know, the funny thing is that... that uh, uh, I don't know if we're about the same age. I just turned 46 a couple days ago. I'm but <laughs> I I grew up in this little town in Montana and we only got one TV station and and then we got one bad station that we could get on a UHF channel. Was one of those the Truman show? <laughs> Pretty much. Okay, it was it was uh you know, and we had a black and white television and, and so forth. So really, I was I was exposed to very little of what I later grew to love as an adult. But uh, what I saw on television, uh, it, it was it enthralled me to see these these flights of fancy. I was a big fan of mythology and comic books and things like that, and to see those things translated onto into animation which had didn't have the same kinds of budgetary concerns that live action did that was that was really you know you could you could draw anything just like in a comic book and so really animation held a very special place in my heart and although i my favorite show was the super friends which was from hanna barbera that was more because of the characters not because of the of the style of the show or anything like that. But, but really 
when I look back on my childhood, the shows that meant the most to me, the things that I really learned some things from was the filmation shows. Things like Shazam and Isis, R2, Fat Albert and the Cosby Kids, uh, the Superman, Batman, Aquaman cartoon. Those were all shows that really meant something to my childhood. I'm with you. I'm completely with you. I love that stuff. Uh, it's funny, you know. Uh, I mean, there, listen, I, you know, I have to be honest. I, I, I suspect uh, you might have a hard time agreeing with me publicly. There was some stuff that came out of Filmation that was absolute crap. I mean, <laughs> but the stuff that they did really well, Star Trek, the Superman, Batman, the Aquaman, they, I mean, the Archies. You know, I look at the animation of the Archies today, and I had uh, uh, Ron Dante on about two years ago, who was the voice of basically the Archie song, Sugar Sugar, and all that stuff. And I looked, I went back and looked at the animation for the first time since like 1970, and I was appalled at how bad it was and how cheaply it was done and how they just repeated the same stuff. But it was so effective for kids and the you know the the music was very clever and it just it was just very uh, you know it worked well one of the one of the things you have to realize is that at the time that animation was cutting edge for television with the budgets that that a television show had the animation that, that Filmation was producing and Hanna-Barbera and a couple of the other smaller companies was really cutting edge. And Filmation did uh, cut corners by reusing some of their animation over and over. But when they did that, such as you know Tarzan, which is very fondly remembered by fans, if if you said well you know you saw the same shots of Tarzan swinging through the jungle or Tarzan doing his his yell you saw the same shot show after show after show but you look at the animation and it was absolutely lovely animation so they would they would do these scenes in in a way they spent a lot of money to make those scenes look good and it enabled and by reusing them it enabled them to do two things one was they could then spend the rest of the money on making the rest of the episode look as good as they could mm -hmm. and number two they could also keep all of the animation in america and uh, since you've read the book you you know that that's one of the themes that kind of goes through it is that in television animation, you had studios who consistently were taking work away from America, sending it to Korea, to Japan, and other places overseas, and depriving American animators of work. Mm -hmm. And Filmation was the last studio that produced all of its animation in America, and that was very important to Lou. And, you know, I want to ask you a question. I, I don't know if you, you knew this, and somehow I, f I find a way to mention it a lot, but I did a biography with uh, Will Eisner, the comic book uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, legend, and uh, one of the things I heard from a lot of people around him was how cheap he was and how he would, you know, he would use pencils down to the little nub, and at one point they actually made him a belt of all these little nubby uh, <laughs> pencils that were left, and that he, you know, he would cut corners with, you know, if, if, if there was some paper that hadn't gotten used, that he would cut it and put it together in scrap paper, and he would insist people use it rather than buy new. And you know, erasers got used down. The thing. So, okay, essentially, in a lot of ways, he was cheap. Can't mm -hmm. get around it. Um, I didn't get the sense that that, that Lou Scheimer was that way, though. That he, he there was budget constraints, but was he cheap? The he way wasn't. Some of these guys are. He he wasn't cheap. He did come from a a very very. Uh, sub blue collar background but he you know so he he had come from absolute poverty uh to the the point where he made a lot of money in hollywood and he made a lot of animation people who worked in animation very wealthy but lou never you know he put everything he could and he had his workers put everything they could into the shows however they would look for ways to to economically produce what they needed to produce uh, and some of the some of the ways he did that was by reusing footage 
they weren't the only company to do that, and they oftentimes get picked on for that in in the animation. And other animation historians might pick on them for that and say, well, that that happened all the time. But, for instance, if you look at Hanna-Barbera cartoons, one of the elements of Hanna-Barbera cartoons is that most of their funny animal characters were drawn with bow ties on, black bow ties. And the reason for that was so that they didn't have to animate anything below this thick black line on their neck. They could only animate just from the bow tie up. And it was their way. They were already sending work overseas so that they could get it done cheaply. And then on top of that, they weren't animating anything below the necks. And to me, that is much more of a crime to animation than, you know, reusing gorgeous animation of Tarzan swinging through a tree. Mm. Um, but beyond that, when you when you compare animation that was done in the 60s to animation that was done in the 70s or the 80s or now, yes, it does look primitive, but it was also, everything was hand-drawn. They were working with, in many cases, technology that they were developing as they went along. You know, this is pre-computers. They were, uh, in fact, Filmation was the first company to use CGI in a cartoon, which was their Flash Gordon series. So the technology developed as they went along and Filmation did the best they could given the budgets that they had and given the, the technology as it existed at the time. If you compare the Archies, for instance, to He-Man and the Masters of the Universe, there's a significant difference in animation style and yet it's many of the same people who worked on it. Are there uh, technologies or techniques uh, that the Filmation Studio either gets credit for or should get credit for that it developed over time or that it you know, made standard? I, I think that, that more than the specific technologies, the, the things that they should get credit for are the, the ways in which they absolutely changed the industry on a more profound level. For instance, Filmation was the first studio to feature African-American characters in animation. They were the first studio to feature music in their shows, in a, you know, for, to do songs. They were the creators of music videos in the Archies. They incorporated dance. Uh, if you look at the Archies and you realize that it's a gang of teenage kids who had a dog that would sort of talk. He didn't talk to them, but he talked to the audience. He's not a gang. He's a club. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> you know, you can kind of see, hmm, maybe that led to other companies who would do a group of kids who had a dog that could sort of talk, you know. Um, beyond that, they were actively, when, when they had shows, they would actively tell the people who were designing the shows that they needed to feature Asian characters. They needed to feature African American characters. They, they featured characters of different weights. They featured characters that were their female characters were never pushovers. They didn't have girls that would run and trip or, uh, always need to be rescued. They featured character, female characters that were strong, independent, uh, women and and in fact Isis, who was uh, a live action superheroine that Filmation created to go along with Shazam, was the first live action superheroine to have her own regular weekly TV show. The Bionic Woman and Wonder Woman, their regular series, they had had you know uh, pilot telefilms or they had guest starred on the Six Million Dollar Man, but their regular series actually came after. ISIS premiered. So the fact that Filmation would do some of these things was was pretty major. Beyond that, you have things like the fact that Filmation was the first company to feature morals at the end of its shows, most significantly in the Fat Albert shows. Uh, but they didn't just feature morals. They looked for ways... They had educational consultants who worked with them and they looked for ways to make those morals and that message integral to the story itself. They didn't just have G.I. Joe come on at the end and say, 
Now, remember, kids, brush your teeth. The more you know, you know, <laughs> they they would actively tell a story that incorporated those elements that they felt kids should be learning about. One of the one of the main things Lou wanted out of his company was he he felt that it was important. If, if you have kids who are tuning into your shows, it was important that they not only be entertained, but that they also be taught at the same time, that they learn something, that they come away from his shows better than just entertained. And I think that's the significant difference between filmation shows and pretty much every other studio show from the 60s and 70s is you would you might be entertained and there was there were some you know fantastically entertaining shows out there you know Johnny Quest and Space Ghost and Super Friends on and off and you know Scooby Doo every now and then and so forth there were some really fantastically entertaining shows the Croft shows but they were entertainment that's all they were they didn't pretend and they didn't try to be anything else. The filmation shows tried to not only be entertainment, but to also be something beyond that. Are you saying that Charles Nelson Riley didn't teach you anything? <laughs> Croft, I mean, she's still now. Yeah. You know, as an openly gay man, I don't know, maybe Charles Nelson Riley did. But <laughs> can, can I tell you what I found out after those shows ran? My father actually went to a high school with Charles Nelson Riley. <laughs> a couple of years behind him, but my, my aunt, his sister, was in his class. It, it was just, like, bizarre. Anyway, um, well, so uh, should I ask you about Johnny Quest? No, 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 that's another studio. <laughs> um, so were there, uh, just out of curiosity, were there uh, particular filmation shows that you had a particular uh, personal interest in learning about that you were, you know, that you, you were like, wow, I'm going to have, I'm going to have Lou Scheimer in front of me. I got to ask this about, you know, whatever. I'll tell you when I was working on the DVD project, the, the one that I was the most excited about working on was ISIS and anybody who goes to my website or knows anything about me knows that I'm a, uh, a huge Wonder Woman fan. So I like female heroines and, I, I used to get that ISIS was on which is CBS, which is one of the channels that we that was the channel that we got in Montana and the area that I was from. And so I would sit down there and ISIS got her powers by reciting these these rhyming couplets and, and, and little rhymes. Oh, Zephyr winds which blow on high lift me now so I can fly. And I used I had this big piece of butcher paper. And I would sit down, remember that this is well in the days before videotapes were even thought of, much less uh, happening. Um, and, you know, and DVDs were, were something that even science fiction authors weren't, weren't thinking about. So I would sit there with butcher paper and I would write down every time Isis would do an incantation, I would write it down. I would write down episode titles and guest star names and I was creating as an eight year old I was creating episode guides to Shazam and Isis <laughs> you know, is it any wonder that these days I'm a, I'm a pop culture historian I was doing it as a child and it was it was kind of an, a, an exciting time to, to see these these superheroic characters who who really uh it wasn't just... I didn't do that with Super Friends. I didn't sit down and write down episode guides to Super Friends. Because I, it was pure entertainment. That was just watching my favorite superheroes. Mm -hmm. But boy, I would do it with Shazam and Isis. And uh, I remember... Or when, when I did the Isis set, which was the, the, the DVD set that I was most excited about. And, and uh, you know the chapters in the book are probably some of my favorite chapters. Talking about Shazam and Isis. Mine too. <laughs> <laughs> when I did that set, I, I interviewed uh, you know most of the cast members of the show, and Ronalda Douglas, who was on the second uh, season of Isis, she she said talked about how when she was on the show, she had she was shopping in a store, and this little girl came up to her and said, "Don't hitchhike." Now, what that said. 
That had been the moral on one of the episodes. These days, if a kid sees a TV or movie star in a shopping in a store, they're going to go up and they're going to ask for their autograph. They're going to take a picture of them. They're tweet about it. They're going to, you know, it's it's about the cult of celebrity. What that little girl, when she saw Ronaldo Douglas in the store, what she saw was a character who had taught her something that was important, and she wanted to let that woman know and she didn't know if she was the character or the actor she was probably too young to know mm. she wanted to let her know that she had learned something from that episode and i thought that was crystallized that was the best example of what filmation meant to its audience what uh what can you tell us about lou himself lou Scheimer? What, what 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 is he like uh you know what does he like to spend time with what what would we not know about him uh you know, just from seeing his shows? Well, you know, there's some wild stories in the book ab about Lou. Uh, he's very tall. Uh, he's he's uh, extremely foul-mouthed at times. We, we, actually, we had some, we had some, uh, a lot of asterisks in the book. But overall, it, he's kind of, he's kind of like the coolest uncle or grandpa you could ever ask for. Because... Unlike most uncles or grandpas or dads who might bore you with their stories, everything that comes out of Lou's mouth is is fascinating. And I really tried, when I was working on this book with him, I really tried to keep that tone going and, and to, to showcase it in the book is to, to, to make it sound like you were sitting down with Lou for however long it took takes you to read the book and listening to him tell the stories in the same way that I sat down with Lou and, and, and really to understand that this was somebody who he worked in an industry and he made a lot of money and he could have just done, he could have just made shows and not had them mean something. And from start to finish, he, he wanted his shows to mean something and he wanted them done in America and uh, right up to the end they were um, did you have access well did you have access and do they exist I mean Filmation's not an active studio today to the best of my knowledge right right so uh, what was Filmation does it exist somewhere is it archived is it does he have it in his garage I mean what was available to you no, after Filmation was sold to L'Oreal in the late 1980s, it was then sold to multiple other companies, including Hallmark, Entertainment Rights, Classic Media, and just recently, Classic Media was sold to DreamWorks. So now DreamWorks owns the majority of the Filmation library. But there are pieces of Filmation that are owned by other companies. For instance, the Superman, Batman, Aquaman, and Shazam material is owned by Warner Brothers, and uh, Fox owns Journey to the Center of the Earth and Fantastic Voyage. I like and, those too. Yeah, Paramount owns the Gilligan's, the Gilligan shows, and uh, Mighty Mouse and things like that. So there are pieces of filmation that are because they did a lot of licensed properties. There are pieces that are owned by other companies, and little by little, they're making their way onto the market in dvd form or in streaming content or things like that but unfortunately in the process of selling the company a lot of that material got lost it might be in a warehouse somewhere but the what happened was that in the process of downsizing the company l'oreal and hallmark decided that they didn't need the original elements any longer so they digitized everything and then threw all the film away no no yeah. oh. and this is why even on the DVDs there are things that are missing because those elements didn't just don't exist any longer mm. when i worked on the archie's dvd set for instance the original music video for sugar sugar didn't exist any longer in the 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 library hmm. so we had to set it had been played on the ed sullivan show and we had to go to ed sullivan's people and sub license out 
the filmation footage to feature it on the DVD. Wow. So even though they had licensed that footage to use on the Ed Sullivan show, we then had to sub-license it to be featured on the DVDs. Mm-hmm. But there's a lot of that material that just didn't exist any longer. So, you know, as I was working on this book with Lou, there was a lot of, yeah, I, I had full access to all his scrapbooks and the files and, you know, the things in his house. There were a lot of videotapes. And as you'll see in the book, or as you saw in the book, and readers will see in the book, there's a lot of information in there about shows that actually never got on the air. Things that were filmed, uh, pilots that were filmed, entire series that were completed, both live action and animation, that were never released. And, you know, so a lot of those Lou did have. But there's portions of of the filmation library that he doesn't have, I don't have. We don't even know where it exists. Well, I've got, uh, Andy, I've got two more questions for you, and then we'll we'll kind of wrap up. Uh, Did you get a sense that Lou had some personal favorites among all these projects that he did? Yes. Yeah. Lou was proudest of Fat Albert, and it was – it was – he, he was very proud that, that Star Trek had won an Emmy Award because it was the only one of his shows that, that won an Emmy Award. And, it, and Star Trek was a great series. The animated series was really well done. It was worked on by all the people who worked on the original television series. The writers, the producers, the creator, and all the actors were involved on Star Trek the Animated Series in some fashion. So he was very proud of that. But really, he just it just needled him that for all the years that fat albert was on the air it never and 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 it was nominated time and time again for emmy awards but it never won one and even bill cosby said you know lou why do you keep submitting this to the emmy people and and lou says because it needs to be it you know this is a show and it fat albert won tons of awards and it changed Thousands and thousands of people's lives, uh, children's lives, over the years. But it never kind of got. Hollywood never looked at it and said, "Oh, this is this is uh, deserving of an Emmy award." But Lou, that that it was definitely the favorite show of Lou's. Beyond that, you know, He Man and the Masters of the Universe was something that, while it wasn't one of his favorites, it was it was something that really created a whole new media and a whole new way for the animation world to work and created jobs for thousands of people because prior to He-Man being a syndicated Monday through Friday show, there hadn't been been that. Mm-hmm. And when they did 65, the first time they did He-Man and they did 65 new episodes, it meant that he could not only hire you know, the entire staff of Filmation got a job, but they got that job for a full year. Instead of only doing 13 episodes for a network, they could do 65 episodes over the course of a year, and then they went to do other shows in the same manner. When when He-Man was a success, that led to the, you know, Transformers and G.I. Joe and Popples and Smurfs and, you know, all these other syndicated series... And and really, that's what led to Disney starting its own animation division up again for television animation. That's what led to the Cartoon Network. There are a whole bunch of things that can really be traced to the fact that Filmation did it first, showed that it could succeed, and then others took the ball and ran with it. All right, last question. Mm-hmm. Uh, can you think of, uh, let's say, three underrated underappreciated filmation series from all the years uh you know (laughs) i i will say that aquaman would not have become in any way a part of the public you know i i i think that the comic book hero would not have become a, a, a you know kind of both the public knowledge bring brought there wouldn't be a public knowledge of Aquaman, nor would he be the the, the kind of punchline that he can be without Filmation having done the Aquaman cartoon series because it was ultra popular. Mm-hmm. Um, I think R2 was a really excellent series. It was well acted. It was entertaining as heck. 
And it was the first series that actually had an ecological um, message to it. Uh, prior to, it was it was about what life would be like in post-apocalypse Earth. Mm. And, you know, that's that's pretty impressive for Saturday morning kids shows. And a third one, I, I, I really have a soft spot in my heart for kind of the, the conglomeration of things that happened in, in the, the, the late 70s that was both Kid Superpower Hour with Shazam and the Batman Tarzan Super 7. Uh, that they were doing anthology shows and they were, they were mixing seven-minute cartoons and 14-minute cartoons and half-hour cartoons. They were mixing them all together in kind of really interesting ways. They were telling serialized stories with Jason of Star Command and so when you tuned into those shows every week, you you literally, you knew you were going to be entertained, but you didn't know which elements of that storyline you would be getting next. Mm. And and that anthology element was was really very creative. Cool. Well, uh, Andy, really interesting conversation. Love the book. And uh, folks, I want, I want to make sure you know, you can find uh, Lou Scheimer, Creating the Filmation Generation, co-written by my guest today, Andy Mangles, uh, in great bookstores everywhere, where you can order right now at a great price at mrmedia.com, delivered by amazon.com. And if you're watching the video, you can look just below us, down here, and there should be uh, an image of the book. You can just click on it right now, take you to Amazon. You can order the book. You'll get a great price on it. Uh, Andy, you've got a website that is your name, right? It's Andy Mangles, M-A-N-G-E-L-S.com. That is correct. Right. You, and, I've got about twenty. This is my twentieth book, so I've got a lot of lot of projects that people can check out. Excellent, excellent. And uh, are you on Twitter, or Facebook, any of that stuff? I am on Facebook, and I have a Twitter account, but uh, I, I'm an old man. I don't know how to use it. <laughs> <laughs> I've never I've never tweeted uh, on Twitter. <laughs> or anywhere else, apparently. Okay. <laughs> well, Andy Mangles, thank you so much for joining us on Mr. Media today. It was really interesting, and I, I really I really like the book a lot. Thanks very much, Bob. And, and thanks for having me. My pleasure. You can see and hear almost a thousand Mr. Media interviews by visiting our main site, mrmedia.com, mrmedia.com. Or check out the more than 200 video interviews on the Mr. Media Radio site on YouTube. And I'd sure appreciate if you'd show some love for Mr. Media's advertisers, including Stitcher. Apple named Stitcher a top five news app of 2011. It's a free mobile app for your smartphone or tablet that lets you listen to your favorite shows and discover the best of news, entertainment, and sports on demand. You can listen whenever you want to to more than 5,000 shows get customized recommendations, and discover what your friends are listening to. My own list of Stitcher favorites is pretty eclectic. I start my day with an hour of MSNBC's Morning Joe with Joe Scarborough and Mika Brzezinski. Then it's the latest two-minute update from the Onion News Network. After that, I'll listen to WTF with Mark Marin. Here's The Thing with Alec Baldwin, HBO's Real Time with Bill Maher, and excerpts from E's Chelsea Lately and The Soup with Joel McHale. Also in regular rotation on my Stitcher playlist, The BS Report with ESPN's Bill Simmons, The Tech Crunch Headlines, and The Don Geronimo Show. The latest episodes of each show, whether originating from broadcasts, cable TV, radio syndication, or podcasts, are continuously updated. Stitcher is a free app for your iPhone, iPad, Kindle, Fire, Blackberry, Droid, and more. And show your support of Mr. Media by getting, did I mention it's free? The app at stitcher.com slash Mr. Media. That's stitcher.com slash MR Media. Stitcher Smart Radio, the smarter way to listen to radio. We're also supported by Audible. Check out Audible's 30 day trial membership and download the audiobook version of the book everyone's been talking about, Fifty Shades of Grey by E.L. James. Sign up for your free trial today at audible.com slash radio. Again, audibletrial.com slash radio. And finally, if you need a disc jockey for a wedding, bar mitzvah, corporate event, or just a big old party, please consider calling 1-800-DIAL-DJs, the party authority, for all your party entertainment needs. You can call 1-800-DIAL-DJs or go to their website, 
1-800-DIAL-DJs.com and tell them Mr. Media sent you. And thanks for listening.